And some of you yelled with a fake yell, because that was me when I was 24 years old, it was a fake yell. I was fat and a piece of shit, and I was yelling, yeah, where would it fucking be? All right, those who didn't yell, think about this. Why aren't you there? What is holding you back? What is in your mind? What is in front of you? What is your foxhole looking like? That means the people around you. Why aren't you dominating the world that you want to be in today? That's for you to answer, not me. Let's get this shit started. Sorry, I'm trying to keep my distance, you know. Uh, so David, I got a 10 year old. God. And I was making him carry bricks the other day. <laughs> yes. you know? And he's carrying bricks and he's grunting and groaning. And I stood on the other side of the thing and he started screaming, Who's going to carry the boats? <laughs> you hear your 10 year old screaming, Who's going to carry the boats? Hey, that's that's cool. shit. So I, I want to hear the story. I mean, I know you probably told it a thousand times, but tell us the story about who's going to carry the boats. Well, who's going to carry boats has several different stories. Because I've said it several different times. But what it's most known for is. I guess TikTok got a hold of it or some shit, and I'm with Cameron Haynes, and I'm in a dark, dark place. Like, we ran 30 some miles that day, then we're in the gym and we're just lifting like tons of reps. And I get to a point in this, in this situation, it's, it's, it's like our last set, and I think Cameron got like 18, and his son got like 17, and I've been averaging that, you know, 18, 17. But at this time, man, it's like, I'm done, I'm tired. And I always say that when shit gets bad. So that just came out. So where it comes from is I'm in Hell Week, and I, I gotta stand up for this fucking story. I can't stand up for this shit. So anyway, what's going on is that you have boat crews. In boat crews, you have six people, okay? Six people per boat crew, at least when I went through. So we have, the stronger guys are usually at the end or, or at the front of the boats. Okay, because in front of the boat's the heaviest part of the boat. And the back of the, you know, so the back of the boat is people who are kind of weaker. So they stay back there. And if you're a good boat crew leader, you know who's tired, you know who's not tired, and you kind of reposition this guy, okay? So we have one really weak guy, and we're kind of carrying him through. But there's one thing that you're gonna get out of this, man, it's called, people always ask me questions about teamwork. When do you know when to kind of Talk to a person to get them better, and when do you know when to get rid of a person? Okay? People always wonder that shit. You talk to them, and you talk to them, and you talk to them, and then you gotta start thinking, there's no more talking I can do. They just don't want to be here. And that was this guy. So I led, I led, we had Chris Kyle, we had me, we had, we had fucking uh, Freak Brown, badass both of them. But there's one guy, this is like, great, I got some help. I got some horses, and I can just hang out in the back. So it's called duck and boat. Duck and boat is where like, the first guy, I'm always the first guy because I'm like, hey, I'm a leader. When, when you lead, you must carry the heaviest load of the group. Because why, if you tell everybody else to do that, guess what they're doing? You're a piece of shit. So the heaviest, so I'm carrying the heaviest part of the boat, number one guy. I always put him back, number six guy. And number six guy, it's a height line. So I'll push about six one, six one, six two. That's what I am. So, but all you gotta do is if you're in the back of the boat, number six guy, you just kind of duck that little neck of yours called ducking boat. So what happens is the boat end up doing this on your head versus you holding weight. So he kept ducking boat, ducking boat. I kept talking to him on the boats, on the logs. I was talking to him. So this particular day. We're in Hell Week, I'm fucking pissed the fuck off because he's not carrying the weight. My neck is broken, Bill Brown's neck is broken, Chris Kyle's neck is broken, but this guy's happy as shit because his neck ain't fucking broken. So, I talk to him. I go, you know what, you really don't want to fucking be here, do you? He goes, no, I really don't. And we went on and on, we kept carrying it, kept carrying it, kept carrying it, got real hard, and this is when this saying came out. I'm sitting here, we're going over the burn, back over the burn. I go, hey, no, man. I'm gonna put you in my spot. My spot's heavy. My spot broke my fucking neck. So he's up there like this. And guess what? About two minutes later, the guy looks at me, tries to turn his fucking head around, like, hey, get up here. I'm like, no, you fucking got it, bro. I've been up there for 72 motherfucking hours. 72 motherfucking hours. And I'm gonna be up there again, because I know you're about to leave. So he's up there, he leaves, and as he's leaving, my boat crew's energy left with him. 
They're like, oh my God, man, now we got five guys to carry this heavy boat. But what they didn't realize, we only had three guys carrying the boat to begin with. So when he left, I saw the energy leave. And as a leader, you have to find something to re-energize the guys. And as he was leaving, I had a, the boat got down, and I went back to the front spot, and I yelled at him and go, hey, motherfucker, when you leave, who's gonna carry the boats and the logs? And my boat crew just went, Rawr! And we got back around the fucking log. We got on the boat, that was it. And I carried that through. It became a mantra, it became something that could carry both through to, through everything. And that's all it takes, man. When you're a leader and things are falling apart, you have to look for that opportunity to lead. And most people like to lead when it's 70 and sunny. You that motherfucker that wants to lead when it's minus zero and snowing like a bitch. Be that guy. And that's what I was looking for after I grew my balls. <laughs> and that, that took a while, so I'm not up here going, look at me, because yeah. I was once way the fuck down there. Yeah. You still say it? I said it one more time in that video, yeah. and I said it, and I'm like, it, it just took off on TikTok, man, and I'm like, and that was, that, that's the real me. When I start getting in that pain cave, this energy comes out. Like, when I get on stage, man, I cannot get on stage and not cuss, mm -hmm. because that's just the energy that flows through me, because I want... There's a lot of motivational speakers who come out here and speak to people. And they speak to people about bullshit. They're totally fucking you over. Because they ain't doing shit. I know most of them ain't doing a damn thing. They ain't living the life. They go home and they say to themselves and all their little board of people, mm, the fuck can I say to motivate some people today? Because I ain't living this shit. But I'm gonna make some damn money somehow. So let me see. I don't do that shit. Everything that comes from me comes from the dark, dark place of trying to grind and trying to get somewhere where I gotta go. And that knowledge comes from that. So I gotta bring that to these people. It's really good, it's really good. You're pushing yourself today to do hard things, but was the hardest thing ever, when you talk about being fat, overweight, was that the hardest moment? Or was the hardest moment some 100 mile race? Or was the hardest moment hell week? Like what's the hardest thing David Goggins has ever done? That's a great question and it's tough to answer because the way my mind works, I'm in that moment. Like when I was trying to lose 106 pounds in two and a half months, it's really three months, but I lost in two and a half. That was the hardest thing ever in my life because I didn't have like someone cooking for me. I didn't have like, I, I mean, I made a thousand dollars a month. You know, I was broke off my ass and I had to fucking work so hard. But I can tell you this, this is the one thing that does stick in my head. I can't ever get it the fuck out of my head. And a lot of people read Can't Hurt Me were in here, so you didn't. If, if you didn't, I don't know what shit. I can't you did. Appreciate that. There's a story in there I talk about, and this is after I went through Ranger School, and I, went, I was in three hell weeks, and I lost all this weight. And what that did for me was a lot of us, you know, we tell our kids, you're good, you're great. We, we build their self-esteem up. That shit don't do nothing for you, man, if you don't believe it. If you don't put the time in and the work in, but what I did, I put all that time in and I work in, and what it did was gave me a little bit of an ego. And this race right here that I'm gonna describe to you, put that ego and buried that motherfucker. I realized I ain't the shit. So I went through all this shit, and I wanna raise money for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. A lot of you heard of the story of Mark, you know, Marcus the Trail, lone survivor, plane crash, or guys went down, uh, three, three of his guys got killed, guys went in QRF team came in, that guy shot down. I was in Buzz because of the three hell weeks. I was in Buzz with every single one of those guys that died. I was just there for so damn long. So I tried to figure out a way to raise money. So long story short, I'm doing cardio 20 minutes every Sunday on the elliptical training. I was a meathead. All I did after I graduated Buzz was I lifted weights and ate like a fucking madman. And that's it, I just wanna be big, be meathead. I carried the 60, the bigger you are, the scarier you are, whatever. So here I am, I call this guy Chris Kostman. I, I Googled the 10 hardest races in the world. And what came up was the Bad Water 135. I knew nothing about ultra running. And I thought that this race was a fucking stage race. I didn't know people ran 135 fucking miles at one time. So, literally, I thought, I was like, this motherfucker, I'm like, 135 miles, I thought, I was like, you had an RV, 
you, you parked, you barbecued and shit, and then you ran like 20 more miles. I thought it was just a stage race. So I called the guy up on the phone, I'm like, hey, hey, Chris, um, I, I'm a Navy SEAL, and I get my resume, he goes, I don't give a shit what you've done. And, and this is true fucking, and this is so true, it's scary. So anyway, I'm talking to him, he goes, you gotta do 100 miles. And I was like, what, in like a couple weeks or what? He goes, no, in 24 hours or less to qualify for my race. And I lived in San Diego. In San Diego, I call him on a Wednesday. And I told you how I trained. Call him on a Wednesday, he's calling my bluff now, because I'm a big bad Navy SEAL, right? So I thought. He said, uh, Saturday, right there where you're from, is one of the last races you can do to qualify for the Bad Water 135. I go, what is it? He goes, it's called the 24-hour one day where you're gonna run a one mile track for 24 hours, 70 miles you can get. And I'm like, I go to the, I was dumb as shit in school, but this is, I might have still been dumb as shit. So I'm, I'm doing the math, 100 miles, that's a 14 something mile, I can walk this shit. Easy as hell, ego, fast as fuck. So at the time I'm married, I call my wife up, she's a nurse, I said, hey man, I'm gonna go to San Diego one day on Saturday. So, Basically, I got a couple of days to train for this shit. And I went, didn't know about nutrition, nothing. I went to, I went and got a blue lawn chair, because I see her every mile. Rich Crackers Mile Place. Now let's cut to the real chase. Let's get to it. So now, I'm running, and there's a picture out there. I'm all ripped up and shit. I'm about 225 or 230, whatever it was. Bigger guy, ripped up. I remember this little Japanese lady. She's a world record holder. I don't know shit about this little Japanese lady. But me and this little girl are cruising for 50 miles, man. I got my hat down, I'm cruising with her. When you have, when you have done 20 minutes on the elliptical fucking trainer once a week, what do you think happens? The endorphins ran the fuck out, okay? I'm sitting there at mile 50, getting a sip of Mileplex and eating a rich cracker. What do you think happens? You're not hydrating and putting electrolytes shit. That rich cracker becomes a ball of just shit. They you suck the salt out of it. So I spit that motherfucker out, and I'm eating this shit. Okay, so now I get to mile seven, because now my pace falls off. She keeps on this laugh. Oh, you're doing a good job. You're doing I'm like, fuck you, man. Because <laughs> now she's just running like this, and I'm doing this shit. You know, I'm all fucked up. This is real. This is nothing. I'm giving you guys a portion of this shit. You want the hardest shit? This is it now. I'm at mile 70. I sit down in this blue lawn chair, and I am fucked up, having pissed, having shit, having done nothing in 12 plus hours, I'm at mile 70. So when you sit down after you've done 70 miles and you never have gone anywhere near this range of distance, you're pretty proud of yourself. I got 30 more fucking miles to go, bro. That's a long way to go if you're fresh. So now I'm sitting there and I'm getting dizzy, I'm lightheaded, I'm all fucked up, I'm like, oh my God, dude, I'm shaking. Everything just comes to reality. My blood pressure is tanked now. Sat down, blood pressure's gone. When you try to stand up, okay, and you are hypotensive, you can't stand the fuck up. It's a bad thing. Now I got a shit. <laughs> and there's a porta potty for me and those guys over there, not far at all. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm trying to stand up. I'm like, oh, fuck, man, I'm really fucked up. I'm like, now I'm getting scared, I'm getting nervous and shit. I'm like 30 something years old, and I'm looking at my wife, and I'm like, I'm just like this. I'm like, hey man. I'm like, hey man, do you love me? <laughs> she goes, yeah. I go, uh, good, I'm gonna shit on myself right now. <laughs> and this is exactly how it was, dude. I am sitting there, totally, ego is busted. Ego's in my ass somewhere, like, come out. And I'm sitting there, like, and I'm sitting there, shitty and up my back and pissing blood down my leg. And I'm like, all right, man. I'm like, okay, fuck. So this is where things for me, I learned a lot. Because right now my mind is just, is full of clutter. I have to quit. I am done. So what I did, how I got through that, is a lot of people don't understand what you have to do is when your mind is full of shit, you have got to hit that pressure release valve. I said, okay, man, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna quit. So then everything just kind of felt better. I ain't getting off this chair, I'm gonna clean, I'm, I'm good. But then I took stages, so I knew I wasn't gonna quit. 
but I acted like I was, just to relieve the tension and stress of my body and my mind. You told yourself. I told myself I'm going to quit, but in the back of my mind, my mother said, motherfucker, you, you ain't leaving this motherfucker. <laughs> so now I'm saying, okay, I have to get cleaned up first. Let's get cleaned up. And slowly but surely, I'm now like, okay, there's a table over there that I didn't use, and food. Just, I'm a Navy SEAL, need your table your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and Rice Krispie treats and, and, and water and gator. I don't need that. I needed it. <laughs> Bad as fuck. So I go over there and my wife is bringing me all this shit. So as you know, now I'm eating real food. It took a while for my stomach. I'm just dehydrated, jacked up. So after a while, now I'm starting to feel better. But my legs are real fucked up. So I'm like, okay, you know what, man? I tell her, I'm going to do one more. Because that would be an amazing accomplishment for me to do 71 miles. I was near death. It let me get up and do one mile and I'm going to walk to the car and go. I did a mile. The mind started clicking. Okay, we walked a mile. We said, that motherfucker got it. <laughs> let's, 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 let's just do one more go home. Two miles. Now I get to mile 81. And this week is very interesting. This is why people will never understand me. And I'm not saying to do this. I'm saying don't do this. <laughs> but I did it. You got to turn that phone off, dog. You can't be having that ringing, ringing, ringing this motherfucker while I'm talking. God, rude ass motherfucker. <laughs> All right, so I'm at 81. And she's like, hey, you're, uh, you're not going to make the time if you keep walking and stopping and doing all this shit. So at this time, this is when I realized, okay, let's see if we can run. I ran the last 19 miles of that race, averaged a 10 minute mile, wow. and did 101 miles in 19 hours and six fucking minutes. <laughs> and I drew that out so long for one thing. Along the way, I came up with this 40% and it's this governor that we have in our brains. The governor I had in my brain when I was 24, and I was abused, and I was called nigger, and I was fat, and my dad beat me with a belt buckle, and, then, and I couldn't read and write to it. I had this governor on my brain because right now, if I didn't take the governor off, I would be that fat black dude working for equal ass brain for cockroaches to this day. Because it's amazing looking back, it's the scariest thing in the world for me, knowing that that was David Goggins. And I could have died that guy versus this one. So what we do is the brain, as you know, cars back in the day, they had governors on them. And if you go so fast, 97, it says 130. But at 97, we're going to start kicking you like this. You ain't going no fast. You ain't going to chase that Corvette. That's what we do to our brains. But instead of Ford or Chevrolet being the factory, we are the factory. And we put these governors in our mind. And we keep them there. And the more pain and the more suffering, the more toxic shit that happens to our lives, it brings us back to this fucking governor. And you have to know how to release that governor and get your full potential. And that's where I realized that I was living, after all the stuff I went through, I realized that that was my thing, man. I had this governor in my mind, and it kept getting set somewhere in my life. So I took that bitch off. Do you do that by, you talk a lot about like incremental versus like trying to tackle the whole thing. Is that one of the steps that you do? Yeah. So those little incremental things, like I gotta go do one more mile. I gotta do two yes. more. Is that how you release that 40%? So how to? you release it is you get yourself to a point where you're not comfortable. Where your brain is saying, okay, man, we're good, we're good. And then you just hold on. Hold on for a little bit. And what happened, so after I did that race, um, so I signed up for a marathon. My first marathon was to be a Las Vegas marathon, but so happened I did a hundred mile race before I did the marathon, which is the dumbest shit in the world. <laughs> but what happened was this marathon was two weeks after my hundred mile race. If you read Can't Hurt Me, you know how bad I was after that race. I could barely even walk. So I told my mom, you know what, I'm gonna walk it with you. Funny thing about that governor, is I tried to run two days before the marathon on this little quarter mile track. I couldn't run. I said, okay, man, my, my, my shins, my legs, stretch back, I'm like, I'm done. That gun went off. And I took off like a bat out of fucking hell and I ran a 308 marathon. It qualified for Boston. And 
This is what is in every single one of us. Because if anybody wants to keep on saying can't hurt me, they people forget. They look at me now. They forget the first 125 pages of this sorry ass fucking kid who literally had no self-esteem, who was vulnerable, who was bullied, who was picked up, who lied, who cheated, who used every fucking excuse in the book to get by and slide. They forget that. <laughs> All right, so this time happened. So basically, I, went, I joined the Air Force. My, my best friend's in here somewhere. He joined with me. He was in the Air Force. So I joined the Air Force, and I went from 175, because I didn't end up making it through pararescue. Pararescue is just not crazy. Hey, you fired up, girl. 175, so I didn't make it from 175 to 297 in about 18 months. Depressed, all kind of shit. So I got in the military, my best friend never saw me at this weight because I was shaming myself. I hid it from him. He thought I went on to become a pararescue, and I did. I went on to be an eco lab test, you know, terminator. And I would go, I was a cockroach terminator, all right? Cockroach sniper. But I hated fucking cockroaches. So when you're, when you're living a lie, and you're not who you want to be, if you have any kind of character, self-esteem, pride in yourself, it stays right here and it haunts you. That's what it did for me. I was a coward, I was afraid, I was all this shit. That's what, that was the real David Goggins. So this is one of the days I tried to invent Goggins. So I come home from work one day, work at Freaker Lab, and I had, I would go by Steak and Shake and they had this massive cup it wasn't made for chocolate milkshakes, but the, me and the manager were real cool. I sprayed the shit down. I said, man, fill that bitch up with the full milkshake. And it became a thing. So every stop, every night for work, he would make my thing, 42 ounces of chocolate milkshake. And then I would go across the street to 7-Eleven, get a box of mini chocolate donuts. I had a 45 minute commute home. I'd eat all that shit. I have some shake left. That's a big ass shake, even for a 300 pound man. And just a little tidbit off of that. When I got home and showered, I go to my mom's house and eat eight cinnamon rolls, half a dozen eggs, almost a pound of bacon, and chase it down with some fucking cereal. That was my breakfast, all right? So anyway, let me go to this. One day I come home, have my milkshake. Put it out there outside my shower, come and take a shower, get all that cockroach shit off of me. And, you know, I didn't spray in the whole thing. I, I, I didn't do my job very good, because I didn't want to. So, anyway, I come out of the shower because I'm hearing this show on Discovery Channel, History Channel, one of them channels about the world's toughest trade. So, as I'm coming out, my towels, they were never made towels big enough for my fat ass. So, I was pinching that shit like this. I walk out. And I'm watching this show with my milkshake. And on this show was these guys going to Navy Steel Training, class 224. And anyway, it goes from like 200 guys down to the last bit of guys. Not a white, not, not, not a black guy in sight. I was a 36 African American over 70 years to make it to Navy Steel Training. So, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, here I am. I'm watching this show. And this is what kind of changed my mind. I was being haunted, but this kind of woke me up. These 18 guys graduate, and I'm seeing them graduate, and he's like, okay, this guy, command officer, gets up there for graduation speech. He said, we live in a society where mediocrity is often rewarded. These 18 men up here detest mediocrity. There's a lot of things people say that just go right past your ears. Everything people said to me with massive ears, I didn't give a shit. I was abused, I was messed up, I was just, just you don't know my life. No one knows my life. Problem was, a lot of my friends knew my life because they lived it. And then he says that, and my mind starts to click. I'm not even mediocre. So what do you think a 300 pound, non-swimming black guy does? Let's go try to be a fucking Navy SEAL. Dumbest shit in the world. So I'm calling these recruiters up, and I finally get to the last recruiter that accepts my call, everybody literally, they said you're fat, you're black, you know, how much do you weigh, laughs, all kind of shit. So I get into this guy, Steven Saljo is his name, I like name drop in case you wanna go check it the fuck out. So I step on the scale, he was nice enough to say okay, in front of the scale was a height weight chart, six foot one, 191, I was in the Air Force prior service, 
I he had my A's and a little calculation. He goes, look, man, I'm sorry. I'd love to get you in the Navy, man, but you only have about three months to lose 106 pounds. I said, why is that? Fuck that, I'm out. Got a milkshake? Oh, yeah.